Good morning, everybody. Um, I think everything I was going to talk about went completely out of my head as soon as we started playing musical instruments this morning, so bear with me if I, if I go off track. Um, as Tanya said, um, my name is Helen Tynan, and I head up our people operations function in Google. So I'm going to talk a little bit more internally focused from a Google perspective. Um, and I suppose the first question is, what is people operations? Um, and our senior vice president of people operations, Laszlo Bach, describes it as HR, but with maths. So if you look at our people operations function, we're actually made up of three different types. A third of us come from a traditional HR or HR generalist background. A third of us come from consulting backgrounds. And a third of us come from analytical or analyst type backgrounds. And we believe when you take those combinations and put them together, you get something a little bit different in terms of how you help to advise the organization. Um, as I talk a little bit about what we're going to, uh, to talk about today, um, a lot of people are very curious about Google. And they hear some of the wacky stories. They hear about the lying around on bean bags and the, the beer in fridges. And, and they say, oh, it's fine for you to do all those sort of things, and that you've got this culture that people talk about and you know, getting placed well and, and best companies to, to work for. Um, but you can do that. You're big and you've got deep pockets, and you've got the money to spend on people things. And one of the things we believe very passionately is that all of those things, they're just like the little perks or the frills around the edge of Google. And that in actual fact, the things that make Google a very special and unique place to work are some of the things that any company can do. And it's one of the reasons that we actually talk a lot to people about some of the things that we do, because we believe that it's replicable in any organization, regardless of the size and regardless of the funding. And there's some of the things that I'm actually going to talk about today, concepts that you could try out in any of your organizations, because we believe if everybody tried some of these things, every workplace could be the best place to work. Talking a little bit about Google, stepping back, we started up in 1998. A very small organization started in a garage, um, quite different to the environment that we're in nowadays. Um, and it was started by Larry and Sergey. And when we went IPO'd in uh, 2004, they wrote a letter, a founder's letter. And it's actually a really interesting letter to, to read. And I'd encourage any of you who are interested to have a quick read. It's very easy to read. Um, but one of the things they stated up front to anybody who was thinking of potentially investing in Google, um, there was sort of a little bit of a health warning in there. And, and what it was was, we are not an intent, a conventional company, and we do not intend to become one. Um, and so they set their stall out from the very beginning that they were going to do things differently. And they were, they were going to try out different things. They were going to stay wacky. They were going to stay small, no matter how big they got. And that's something that remains true to today. They also talked about, um, we have a, a, a document that was conceived at the very beginning about 10 things we hold to be true. And they hold a, a number of different facts that get quoted every now and again. You've got things like you can be serious without a suit. They also talk about doing one thing really, really well is a great idea. And for years, that's what we did. We really focused on search and focused on our mission. Um, and nowadays, you can see we've diversified a lot, but we actually still believe that all of the things we do are unified by the fact that we use technology to try and transform the world. So we started off with trying to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. And now we've gone on to, to do moonshots and to do crazy things. There's a lot of talk about driverless cars. It is just amazing what driverless cars can do. It sounds sort of gimmicky and fun, like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty cool. But in actual fact, there's a lot of really important social implications for that. You know, an aging population who would now still be able to get around when, when they go past an age that they can drive. Imagine solving all the world's problems in relation to traffic and congestion. Imagine increasing the road safety of all of our worlds. There are real things that can be done and can be transformed by that. And these are some of the things that Google didn't even know that we were going to start to think about in 1998. But as time went on, our organization has transformed, but continued on this journey to, to do things with technology that can transform the world. Very different to the garage that we started out with. This is our, our headquarters in Mountain View in California. And if Google was um, a candidate who applied to us, this is probably a little bit of what the resume would look like for Google. So at this point in time, we have 46,000 Googlers. 
Um, we call them Googlers rather than employees. Sometimes in Ireland that can feel a bit cringe, a bit naff. But it's not actually. The, the reason behind it is because we want each person who joins Google to believe that they are a part of the organisation. They all have equity in the company and have a strong sense of ownership and belonging to Google. At this point in time, we're based in 40 different countries around the world and we have 70 different offices. And we'll talk a little bit more about the implications for that and how we use technology to stay small and to stay connected. But this is something that as your organisations grow or as you have organisations with presences in different offices, it brings different challenges and opportunities from a cultural point of view. And here then are some of the facts that, that really show like the craziness of the world that we live in today. I mean, who would ever have foreseen that there would be 3 billion Google searches per day? Or that when you look at Android devices, there are 1.5 million of them activated every day. I mean, it's just such a different world from the world that was conceived at the very beginning. Um, if I look at, at Google, actually, the other thing I would say about us from an organisation point of view, we're roughly half and half between engineers and sales. And then in the middle, we've got uh, groups like HR and finance, legal and communications. But there are very small functions in comparison with our engineering and with our um, sales functions. And when we look at one of the things that we do from a people operations point of view that we believe has a big impact from a cultural perspective. So sorry, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm actually going to go through four of these. So four things that we do a little bit differently that we believe any organization could consider if they wanted to try and, and, and change things. So one of the big things from a people operations is that we actually try to make sure that every single people decision that we make in Google is based on data. So I mentioned that point, half engineers, half sales. Salespeople you can sell to, you can persuade. Engineers you cannot sell to, you cannot persuade. You have to be able to use data. You have to be able to have analytics to back up any proposal that you make. And this is a discipline that we bring in into our operation from a people operations perspective that we think is truly valuable um, and changes the way we work. Some of you may have heard the stories about how we interview at Google. I know before I joined here, I've worked in, in various different US multinationals for over 20 years. Um, and I used to hear stories of people who had done 17, 15, 13 different interviews and still hadn't been offered a job in Google. It seems like the world and its mother had to interview you and you still might not get a job. And that actually was the case. There were lots of people who were doing interviews, up to 17 and 18 interviews. And we all interview individually. So in Google, you'll never be interviewed by two people at the same time. So everybody interviews individually. And it only takes one person to say, I don't think we should hire this person and the person won't be hired. It's a huge time investment in hiring people. And a number of people in people operations decided to do some, an analysis, some analysis on this. So they took every single interview that had been done, and they looked at it, and they looked at the scores they had been given by every single interviewer. And they started to correlate the two. And what they realized was that with every single interview that they did, the probability of actually determining that we were hiring the right person was increasing until we got to four. And when we got to four after that, the law of diminishing returns kicked in, which was after that, yeah, they added a bit of value, but it was negligible. And so overnight, we pivoted from having multiple interviews up as far as 17 or 18 down to four. And now everybody who comes into Google on average goes through four interviews. So that's one of the places where we've used analysis and data to help inform our decisions. We've done some pretty cool things in relation to food and analysis around food. You'll all have heard the story about Google and free food everywhere, and micro kitchens that you pass and are fully stocked with food. We have a thing in Ireland that we call the Google Stone. Everybody who joins Google puts on a stone and then spends the next few years trying to lose it. Um, but this used to be a fantastic differentiator. Oh, free food in Google, that makes us different, and people love working here. But what we actually found is that with time, people were putting on weight, and it was making them less happy and less healthy, and we wanted to try and help tackle that. So we sent in and did loads of different pieces of analysis. And as a result, changed some of the, the eating habits in Google. So simple things, like we discovered that when people go into a restaurant and they're really, really hungry, they stock up on the first thing that they see. So now when you go into a Google restaurant, the first thing that you see is the salad bar. The desserts are in the furthest corner. So you can absolutely go to them, because that's another thing we learned about Googlers, is they don't like to be told what to do. They don't like when things are removed that are unhealthy. We're adults. We'd like to choose ourselves. So we give them information. For example, we have signs up in the, in the restaurant that actually give an indication of the sort of calorific value or what's healthy or what isn't healthy and therefore how often you should eat it. 
And we also did some analysis about the size of plates. I know this sounds crazy, but they actually discovered, depending on the size of plate, people tend to fill their plates when they're hungry. And if you give smaller plates rather than larger plates, people will put on average two kilograms less per year. And so we put both plates out so people still have a choice, but with a little sign over it saying, did you know, if you take the smaller plate, and usually you eat what's on your plate. If you're like me, you were brought up to finish everything that was on your plate. So these are other places where we do sort of wacky experiments based on data that actually inform a lot of our people practices. So the use of, of data to make people decisions. Second principle, hiring is absolutely the most important thing that you will ever do. You can make 99 brilliant hires and one toxic hire will transform and ruin your entire organization. In Google, the hiring manager does not make the hiring decision. So we always interview by committee. We talked about the four interviews. We always make sure that there are four interviewers interview completely separately, put in their feedback independently, so they don't discuss them with each other until at the very end. Um, and we also make sure that there's always somebody from outside the hiring team or outside the hiring function, completely external, because we believe that the people that we hire could move into any job in Google, and therefore we need to make sure that they're good for the company. And it just takes one of those four to disagree with the hiring decision, and the person will not be hired. When we hire people, we hire against these four attributes, regardless of the role. We hire against general cognitive ability, how smart they are. And Jamie, who will be coming up later after me, will talk a little bit more about that. We look for role-related knowledge, but we don't get hung up on it, because at the end of the day, the job that we hire you for today or tomorrow will be completely different in a year's time due to the pace of technology. So we're looking for people knowing about the current job just isn't good enough. We need to know that they're going to be able to learn any job. We interview for leadership, and, and the last thing we interview for is googliness. Um, and that's, we, we actually, the best description of that when we're interviewing for people is what we call the airport test. If you're in an airport and your flight is delayed by four hours, would you want to be with this person? And there are so many people that to spend longer than an hour with them would kill you. So why would you hire them into your organization? The third principle is one that we talk about in relation to mission transparency and voice. Mission I already mentioned to you. Every single person in Google can quote what our mission is. We all, we all know what it is. We all joined Google because we passionately believe that the products that we design have a transformative effect in the world, and we really, truly believe in them. Transparency is the thing that struck me more than anything else when I, when I joined this company. We are so incredibly open with our Googlers. We share everything. We'll talk a little bit about some of the tools that we use, but those tools are available to everybody. We share information on our business performance. We share information on our products. We get information before the public gets information, or worst case, exactly simultaneously if, there's, if there are rules in relation to that. Um, in comparison with any other company that I've worked with, I remember when I used to be preparing for all hands when you'd be standing up in front of large groups of employees. And in previous companies, you could spend hours prepping for those in terms of what you could answer, what you couldn't answer. What, if they asked you this, how will you handle it? Because that's sensitive information. I love all hands here in Google because no matter what question you get asked, you're never prepped for it because the expectation is you will answer it honestly and openly. And if you know the answer, you will share the answer, even if it's an answer that people might not be comfortable with. We're all adults. We all deserve to hear the truth. And that's something that we're very passionate about that we believe really helps create a culture that people want to work with. And voice. I've mentioned the people that we hire, they're smart, they're, they're people who are passionate about their values. As far as we're concerned here, those people, we want to hear from them. We want to them to challenge decisions. We want them to question decisions. We don't want the most senior person in the room to be the person who makes the right decision. We want the best decision. So if, they're, you know, if the leader is coming up with, I think we should go this direction, and somebody pipes up who's in the company two weeks, I think that's mad, we should go this way. Well, let's, let's actually find the best way. That's what we want, is the best way. It doesn't matter who came up with the idea. The best ideas are the best ideas, regardless of where they come from. Um, and the fourth principle that I would talk about is in relation to that managers matter. Um, you may have learned at the very beginning when Google set up, we were notoriously sort of anti-managers. We didn't think they were the best things in the world. And at one stage, actually, Larry and Sergey did an experiment, and they got rid of all managers in the company when the company was quite small. And after a number of months, the engineers came back to them and said, please, put the managers back in again. And what we've learned is that managers matter a lot. Again, using data and analysis, we have discovered that a manager is the single most influential thing on a Googler's happiness. 
it's, it holds true for anybody. That, you know the expression, people don't leave companies, they leave managers. The most important decision that you made, that you make is in relation to your managers. We make sure that we measure that. So when we found out they were so important, we actually went out and we interviewed employees to try and find out who were the most popular, the most successful, the best managers. And then we went deeper on them to try and understand what is it that they do that's different to other managers and that we should be trying to emulate. We came up with a list of very simple principles, but they don't have to be rocket science. These are the eight things that we discovered that managers, if they do them, will make their employees happier or will get the most out of their employees. And we survey our employees about our managers twice a year and give that feedback and coach those managers. I'm about to run out of time, so I'm going to speed up terribly fast to just cover my last couple of things. The world we're living in, as Tonya mentioned, it's changing. It's changing hugely. The employees that we have, they span so many different generations. We have this global workforce across these 70 different offices. How do we keep them all connected? We've got a workforce that are big into social media. These are all the things that are happening in the world around us. And in Google, we don't try to contain them or to just manage them. We try to embrace them and bring them into our culture, recognizing that these are the things that will make a difference to our culture. One of the big ways that we do it in Google is through use of our own technology. I mentioned just even taking the, the logistics of having people and teams from all over the world. I'm part of a management team uh, that's global. And when we have our staff meetings, there are 14 of us, all of us in individual offices, and we're all using Hangouts to connect. So we don't do conference calls on phones. Everything that we do is through Hangouts and through video technology. So we can see the people in other countries and by the time we actually ever get to meet them, we feel like we've known them all our lives. We know exactly what they look, at, look like, and it feels like we've been sitting in the same room with them for years. We use all of our tools. So we use our docs, we use our spreadsheets, we use our, our um, slides. And you can have 20 people. I remember working on a reorg, and there were 20 of us in the one presentation at the same time, all updating it and doing it real time and getting this amazing collaboration going, even though none of us physically sat in the same office. So it is incredible what technology can do it. And we use things like our moderator tool to make sure that these voice, the voice that our employees have, can be heard. If you're doing an all hands with 10,000 people across the globe, who's going to put their hand up and ask a question? It's quite a hard thing to do. So we all input our questions and people vote on, yeah, that's the best question. So that anybody who's facilitating can actually see the most burning questions that are out there and they're not wasting their time answering every question, just the ones that have percolated up to the top. Our work environments are famous. Our work environments don't have to look and feel like this. The key to them are the principles that can be replicated in any organization. Forget about offices. Open plan is where the collaboration happens. You know, things like football tables or things like pool tables. What do they do? They just encourage people to get together and to talk and to make connections so that when they actually need each other from a work context, they've already formed relationships. A lot of the things that we have in our work environment, they might look cool, but they're on those very simple principles around collaboration and letting people collect, connect and innovate together as a group. The last thing I would say to you before I leave you and pass over to, to the next speaker is, you know, we're now a teenager as an organization. We're, we're going on 16 years old. We didn't get all of these things right from the very beginning. A big principle of ours in relation to our products is launch and iterate. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect before you launch it. Get feedback along the way and then keep changing it so that with time it'll become perfect. And I think that absolutely applies in relation to culture and how you transform your culture and how you engage your staff. Try some of these things and they'll be clunky and they'll be uncomfortable. This is Google Glass when it started. But when you keep iterating, one day it transforms into being something very beautiful and something very powerful that can transform your organizations. Thank you very much.